So welcome to the sixth uh, lecture in our series on early New High German prose. And uh, it's bringing together two strands we have been looking at. On um, the one hand, the religious strand which we uh, indulged in with the launch of the Zendbrief from Dolmetschen, and on the other hand, uh, the imperial printing of uh, vernacular text. We have been looking at um, the last two sessions with Augsburg um, editions. And um, if you compare this image now with this imperial town from the same volume, you can see in German, you would say, noch eins draufsetzen. This is uh, even more powerful a, a city than Augsburg uh, was. And uh, it had uh, several superlatives to its credit. Um, it was uh, the keeper of what actually was the spiritual center of the empire, any idea what could be the symbol for German empire? Doppeladler, uh, uh, the, actually the double-headed eagle is uh, the imperial coat of arms. And, but quite physically, uh, the, um, it features uh, on these important objects, namely the Reichskleinodien. So the imperial uh, symbols of power consisting of the crown, the scepter, uh, as uh, used in the coronation um, of emperors. If any of you has done paper six, Walter von der Vogelweide, uh, you have read in his poetry the power is uh, uh, given to the person who has hold of, of the symbols. Um, so this isn't uh, just a, a piece of jewelry. It has uh, power, and this power is um, exponentially increased by the combination um, with the other objects that were kept in the same uh, shrine as uh, the imperial symbols, namely the relics. And the most important relic of the Holy Roman Empire was the spear. So the spear with which um, Jesus was meant to have opened uh, uh, the side of Jesus uh, was believed to have been opened by the soldier. So to have this relic that had, uh, had direct contact with the blood of Christ present in the city uh, made it incredibly powerful. It protected uh, the city. It was kept in a hanging shrine, which you can still see in the Germanisches Nationalmuseum, which was built in the 19th century in Nuremberg, uh, as a forerunner of German unity, to have a national museum that was built around these uh, symbols shows that beyond their religious significance, they kept significant. And um, in a way, it also then played its role in the f uh, really uh, fatal role that Nuremberg played in National Socialism because Adolf Hitler chose Nuremberg as place for his Reichsparteitage because of this imperial uh, symbolism of the town. And then the um, Nuremberger uh, Prozesse were again located to counter this or to um, kind of uh, strike out the symbolism by the Allies after the war. So uh, 
this imperial backstory plays a very important role. And the Nuremberg Town Council um, made sure it had full control of this uh, symbolism and um, staging uh, the Reichstag. Every emperor was um, by necessity holding their first imperial diet in Nuremberg because they needed to uh, be crowned and to uh, assemble everybody uh, there. So you, the castle you see above uh, the city um, was furnished by the patrician councillors whenever an emperor would come. Um, the other um, uh, claim to fame of Nuremberg was that it had the most skilled uh, workforce and also the most learned workforce. So um, the fact that Hans Sachs, a cobbler, went to a Latin school was really only possible in uh, Nuremberg. Everybody else everywhere else, um, a cobbler wouldn't even have, probably have learned to read and write just as much as needed to do, do business. Um, but while they had this really skilled workforce, they also had a mortal fear of insurrection. There had been an uh, uprising of uh, the um, artisans in the 13th century, and the town council reacted by banning anything that was organized. So no guilds um, in the town, and you might know that um, uh, the importance of guilds in, in other places, also in England, for staging religious um, drama, for example, but also to organize um, get-togethers. And the only form of organization that was allowed were Singschulen, so um, a kind of Sunday school combined with poetry. And so the Meistersinger tradition uh, comes partly out of it being the only form of collective entertainment allowed to uh, non-patricians in the town. And there were very strict rules um, in how to versify and also in the subject matter, so it had to be uh, positive didactic content mainly based on the Bible. Um, so um, you had a group of citizens that were relatively wealthy um, because of all the trade of Nuremberg, uh, relatively learned, but without an outlet in political engagement as they would have had in other places. And that explains um, the kind of literature explosion you have in 15th century uh, Nuremberg by um, barbers, by um, a harnish uh, macher, so armorers, um, or indeed by cobblers. So um, they have this tradition of Meistergesang, which was confined to uh, manuscript culture, oral. Uh, so you had to present uh, your poem, but it could only be chosen for a prize if it wasn't printed. <clears throat> Again, a, in a way, a, a, a limiting factor to prevent anything from going too far beyond the control of um, the town council. Um, the one uh, time of the year when an outlet was allowed was which time of the year? still have it in, in the Catholic areas of Germany, Fastnacht. So uh, 
the eve before the fasting starts, um, in southern Germany also called Fasnet or Karneval. Um, so the time uh, of a topsy-turvy world where it was allowed to have satire of uh, practically everything, uh, collective uh, amnesty. So the two types of literature Hans Sachs starts out um, with um, our Meisterlieder and Fastnachtspiele. I, I can really recommend reading some of his dramas. Uh, they are incredibly uh, funny, quite obscene, uh, but um, a kind of um, uh, earthy humor that appeals across um, the, the periods. Um, and uh, also the kind of uh, manufactory uh, capital was there in Nuremberg because Nuremberg was also the place where the first paper mill had been built in um, uh, Germany in 1390. Uh, so there was an export ban on used clothes in Nuremberg uh, because they needed every bit of um, used underwear to turn into high quality um, rag uh, paper. Um, and, uh, so this timeline um, of uh, the German Reformation starting met in Nuremberg with a population that had been trained in vernacular religious thinking. Um, that was a town that didn't have a bishop, so the bishop was uh, north of the, t uh, in Bamberg, um, meaning they were at their, um, able to set their own uh, agenda, and they were quite keen also, the patrician town council, to um, be independent of the bishop. They had already bought most of the rights that could be bought in the medieval church, so uh, they were the only town council, as far as I know, that were allowed to appoint their own priests rather than having them uh, sent by uh, the bishop. Um, and um, there was, among the patricians also a discussion group uh, that uh, was in close contact with Staupitz, who was the confessor of Luther in, in Wittenberg. And so <clears throat> uh, they would read Luther's texts uh, pretty much as soon uh, as um, a horse messenger could bring them over from from Wittenberg. So you have letters from Nuremberg showing that they knew of the publication, for example, of the 95 Thesis just weeks after uh, they were published and were discussing um, that. Uh, and we know um, from Hans Sachs' own autobiographical account that he had 40 sermons um, and little treatises printed by Luther in 1522 alone. So um, he was a really keen collector. So that's a letter um, he, he wrote uh, just at that point. And um, as I said, um, Hans Sachs uh, set out publishing already around 1513, so long before Luther started publishing in fairly traditional medium. And suddenly in 1520, he stops. And the next thing we have of him is in 1523, the programmatic uh, poem Die Wittenbergische Nachtigall. 
Uh, and we have this letter saying he had bought everything he could get his hands on of Luther. So he must have spent really three years just reading up on what was going on. And there was a lot of uh, material that was really exciting. So particularly in 1520, uh, the, um, the Libertate Christiana von der Freiheit eines Christenmenschen, um, von der babylonischen Gefangenschaft uh, der Kirche und an, die, uh, an den christlichen Adel. Um, then in 1521, there was uh, the Passional Christi und Antichristi, which uh, was a visually incredibly appealing uh, pamphlet that um, juxtaposed on um, opposite pages always what Christ does and what the Antichrist does. And, um, you can see here Christ is crowned with thorns. The Pope has uh, the triple crown put on his head. Um, then you have Christ washing the feet of the disciples on the one side, the Pope having his feet kissed on the other side. You have um, Christ uh, driving out the moneylenders from the temple. On the right-hand side, the Pope taking in indulgences. And voila, at the very last page, you have um, Christ going up to heaven, Pope, Antichrist going down to hell. So... <coughs> um, when uh, Hans Sachs uh, started publishing in favor of Martin Luther, he also relied on having bildmächtige uh, woodcuts added uh, to it, knowing full well how... Um, this would work and uh, reckoning on the kind of um, visual literacy of his contemporaries as much as on the textual uh, literacy. Um, but at the time uh, also uh, was, um, the discussion was hotting up uh, as, as you saw in these images from 1521, and the Nuremberg town council uh, felt it needed to do uh, something um, because uh, increasingly also the radical elements of the Reformation came into town. So in 1524, Thomas Münzer was visiting, so uh, the leading figure then for the peasants' revolt. And um, he was clearly somebody that the town council didn't approve of. Um, it's fine to discuss matters of religion, but it's not fine to discuss matters of power. Uh, so um, a group of painters who were picking up these topics uh, with images of Karstans, so the f farmer uh, who takes the dreschflegel, so for threshing um, the wheat, uh, and instead use it to uh, thresh. Uh, papal uh, and, and Catholics uh, wasn't a welcome figure in in this city that didn't even allow uh, guilds. So um, they banned uh, four artists, um, which they called the Gottlose Maler from uh, Nuremberg. And uh, some of them had been working together with Hans Sachs. So Hans Sachs had to tried a fine line. 
even though then later in 1525 um, there were the Nuremberger Religionsgespräche, a series of uh, op uh, public uh, disputations between a group of Protestants uh, led by the um, priest at the Lorenzkirche, so um, Nuremberg is still organized in two main parishes. Has anybody been in, in Nuremberg? It's well worth visiting for all sorts of historical reasons. You will rarely find another place that has had so many conflicting um, but for, uh, for um, also it, it very much informed the Mittelalter build of Romanticism, Wackenroda and Tieck were there in 1800. And, um, part of the town was re to make it really this ideal uh, place. Anyway, so um, you had the, you, you see these two churches to the left of the castle with the double uh, towers, which comes from the competition that was between the two halves of Nuremberg. As soon as one parish added a tower, the other also added a tower. Uh, when one parish uh, built a new Gothic uh, choir, the other also built a new Gothic choir. So you have two nearly identical silhouettes of huge parish churches, larger than most cathedral churches, um, if you look from the south to the north in, in Nuremberg, uh, showing that the uh, power in the city was really not with the bishop, but with the citizens who could lease um, windows in the churches to have their coat of arms uh, put up there. Um, which explains that also uh, Nuremberg didn't go for radical form of reformation, so none with iconoclasm, because all the images in the churches had been set up by uh, the citizens themselves. So they were epitaphs for um, their families and so on. So uh, while um, Andreas Karlstadt in Wittenberg uh, was uh, firing up the citizens to tear down statues and Münzer was um, railing against uh, the rich, Nuremberg opted for a soft reformation. Um, uh, so um, Andreas Osiander, the Lutheran priest at the Lorenzkirche, uh, on stage argued for three days with um, the prior of the Franciscan convent in the town, and then the town council said, all right, um, we decide Osiander has won, so we are now Lutheran, but Oh, that's it. Uh, it's just a different label. Um, we don't take anything down. Um, we don't change anything. And, um, don't write anti-Catholic pamphlets. So um, the first edition of Hans Sachs' um, Reformation Dialogue was not printed in Nuremberg but rather in Bamberg, which is ironic since Bamberg was this Catholic stronghold, but um, the printers didn't care because they weren't under the jurisdiction of the Nuremberg Town Council uh, to uh, publish something uh, which they then just delivered back to uh, Nuremberg, but nobody could be held responsible um, for it. And then it was printed in Vienna, and only later when the town council had realized they couldn't do anything to uh, stop Hans Sachs spreading his uh, message, also the Nuremberg printers uh, took it on. Um, Nuremberg keeps on an important role in as 
hub really of information relay. Uh, has anybody of you read the introduction to the Zendbrief from Dolmetschen by Ulrich Bubenheimer? Uh, can you remember what he found? Um, so the Zendbrief from Dolmetschen is published together with a, a shorter treatise on the intercession of saints. And um, really until our edition, it wasn't clear why these topics, which are seemingly uh, unconnected, should be brought together. And most people had assumed also that the form of the Zendbrief was a literary um, disguise uh, just to be able to be uh, more outspoken by pretending it's just uh, writing to a personal friend so it's not an official um, document that is issued but it's uh, a personal opinion in a form of um, intimate uh, language. And what Ulrich Bubenheimer concluded by looking at the form of address, ehrbarer, fürsichtiger uh, Herr und Freund und Gönner, that this is actually the normal form of address which in the Titelbüchlein that were printed in how to, a uh, kind of style guide how to address people, would be the right thing to address a patrician in Nuremberg or anywhere, and that these two topics were actually discussed earlier in 1530 in the town council, and that the person who had to take the minutes was Lazarus Spengler, the Ratschreiber, and if reading up uh, the letters between Luther and Spengler, you can see that uh, this fits perfectly in and that even though uh, the letter of Spengler to Luther isn't um, still extant, it fits exactly as an advisory letter for this situation in 1530 in Nuremberg. So Nuremberg really plays an important role as trendsetter and also as place where things could be reprinted um, very quickly because they had developed printing on an industrial scale. So the Nuremberg Chronicle was the largest print project of the incunable uh, era, and Anton Koberger uh, was still active in the Reformation period, and he could get something like 20 apprentices printing simultaneously. So you could churn out a pamphlet at full speed. So this is uh, the kind of political and literary context now for Hans Sachs to start his um, kind of PR work for uh, the Reformation. And he starts uh, with what he was most familiar with, namely Meisterlieder. So um, the first thing then to be printed uh, was a Meisterlied, but accompanied by a new uh, preface uh, in prose, in which he explained how he had come to um, kind of break this uh, tradition of Meisterlieder to be just um, circulated as handwritten copies and just as a personal opinion. So he felt compelled to advertise the biblical truth to a wider audience. And um, he commissioned uh, this um, woodcut uh, that exactly uh, illustrates all the elements in his allegorical uh, set up. 
Um, and the, the song starts with Wacht auf, es nahet gen dem Tag. Ich höre singen im grünen Haag ein wunnigliche Nachtigall. So, I'm not sure whether this start reminds you of anything. Um, uh, and if you have done as part of uh, Paper 6 Dawn songs, um, or you have done in for the poetry in uh, first year, there is one Dawn song by Wolfram von Eschenbach, uh, Sine Klauen. Um, but is this situation <coughs> before dawn when um, a watchman, and, and that can also be a bird, wakes up the lovers and they have to part. Uh, so, for example, Oswald von Wolkenstein, Wach auf, mein hotes leuchtet hier, von Orient der lichte Tag. Blickt euch die Braufe, nimm den Glanz, wie gar fein grau des Himmels Glanz, sich mengt durch Blau von rechter Schanz. Ich fürcht ein kürzlich Tagen. So this, uh, there in the dawn song, it's uh, the day is feared uh, because it means the lovers mu uh, must part. But here uh, it's a wake-up call for a new light dawning. And this is actually the same rhetoric as the Renaissance, so uh, uh, framing it as dawn of a new era and everybody must be alert and overcome the darkness um, that uh, has been um, going on. So um, it's in praise of actually the a watchman a nightingale, which um, alerts people that they should um, turn away from the uh, deeds of darkness. Wacht auf, es nahen gern dem Tag, ich höre singen im grünen Haag, ein wunnigliche Nachtigall, ihr Stimm durchklinget Berg und Tal. Die Nacht neigt sich gen Okzident, der Tag geht auf von Orient, die rotprünstige Morgenröt her durch die trüben Wolken göt, daraus die lichte Sonn turt blicken, des Mondes Schein tut sie verdrücken, der itzt jetzt worden, pleich und finster. And then um, it ex explains there are a few animals that are against uh, the nightingale and they want it to remain night. And um, the, these are all animals uh, that are taken uh, from the names of Luther's enemies. So, for example, cochleus, which uh, is a Latin word for snail. So um, uh, the snail is against um, the coming of uh, the light, while all the good sheep are um, coming um, to the tree on which the nightingale is sitting. Uh, and you see, um, on the left-hand side where the nightingale is uh, turning to the sunrise and on the right-hand side above um, the donkey. And you, if you have read the uh, Zen brief, you'll recognize the donkeys of Popedom uh, praying uh, to keep the moon up and prevent the sun from coming. Uh, and um, Hans Sachs is in his uh, prose preface taking on a really a bold uh, standpoint and quite a, a selbstbewusst uh, tone and register. Allen Liebhabern evangelischer Wahrheit wünsch ich Johannes Sachs Schurmacher, Gnad und Fried in Christo Jesu, unserem Herrn. Ihr Auserwählten in Christo, alle Männiglicht ist unverborgen in deutscher Nation, wie die christlich gemein etwa lang her, viel Jahr durch Menschenlehr etlicher Sophisten abgeführt ist worden von der Wahrheit, wahrhaften Freiheit des heiligen Evangeliums. So, um, 
he is presenting uh, this as his uh, personally endorsed wake up call. Um, you see underneath the woodcut um, biblical quotation, and that becomes then typical for um, all the Protestant publications that they um, invoke the authority of the Bible. So where in other publications it said by imperial permission printed, it instead uh, uh, quotes from Luke, Ich sage euch, war dieses Schweigen, so werden die Stein schreien. Uh, so uh, that is uh, from a sermon within the Gospel according to Luke, where it said um, you, you can, uh, might be able to silence people, but still uh, truth must be out, and if you won't uh, talk, then the stones call out of the town. And um, then um, one year later, in 1524, uh, he comes up with this really new genre, the kind of prose dialogue. And that, in a way, fuses uh, the different genres he was used in. So uh, it uses uh, the... Um, authoritative voice of uh, the Meister leader and very um, visual language, but um, it crosses it with a um, Fastnachtspiele, uh, the wittiness of um, and quite derb, uh, outspoken um, language. And um, it's really a, a new venture in, in German literature to have stock characters which are still recognizably um, individual people. So the figure of Der Schumacher, who's taking on uh, the fat cannon, is, is clearly... Um, inspired by Hans Sachs, and um, that comes from the fashion you would have in a Meisterlied, where you always ended with your uh, own name as signature. Dass uns daraus viel eher erwachs, das wünscht uns allen Meister, uh, uh, Hans Sachs. Uh, so that would be the kind of normal rhyming couplet to end a... Um, uh, a Reimspruch or a Meister um, lead. And um, this, uh, the title page plays with this crossover in having um, the stock figures uh, recognizable by their. Um, uh, dress and uh, their, uh, the pantoffel in which the cobbler is uh, bringing along. But, um, um, and uh, you had the figures of the kind of fat friar and uh, the um, silly cook and um, uh, the silly artisan in the Fastnachtspiele, but here Hans Sachs uses it for a role reversal because um, as becomes clear uh, soon into the debate is uh, that the artisan isn't the comedy figure and the uh, priest, the learned person who gives out advice, but uh, that actually the sound theological knowledge is with a cobbler um, who puts it on really heavily. Um, I, I showed you the slide in before, and I'll repeat it here for the recording. Uh, these uh, Reformation dialogues uh, were an immediate uh, success. Um, 
and where there were um, 24 editions in the first year of the first dialogue alone in Bamberg, in Vienna, in um, Erfurt, um, in uh, even small places like Eilenburg. And um, then um, this first uh, dialogue actually was even translated into Dutch and English. So as a goodly disputation between a Christian showmaker and a popish parson. Um, done within the famous city of Nuremberg, translated out of the German tongue into English by Anthony Schulocker. Uh, and I'm wondering whether that is actually a, it was also, uh, I, I haven't verified that with any English uh, name specialist, whether Schulocker is a kind of, uh, craft name, that it might be somebody related to uh, that. Uh, there it's, it's printed like a proper dialogue with interspersed uh, uh, lines. And um, you can see that these are pirated copies by looking at the subtle differences between the details such as uh, the nose or the um, hairband of the uh, cobbler in this case. Uh, the uh, canon, canonica, as we said, the core hell uh, is really uh, fat with puffy cheeks and uh, uh, belly and uh, his female cook is suspiciously close uh, to him following on, possibly also indicating uh, that um, many of the uh, clergy that were supposed to be celibate were um, sus uh, suspected to have an um, affair with their housekeeper. Um, it starts with a um, two uh, kind of low uh, uh, level cast, which you would um, have if you have Comedia dell'arte, for example. They would be, as I said, the funny characters, but they start off uh, with a very courteous Latin greeting. So um, the cobbler says, Bonus dies, Köchin. Guten Tag in Latin. Köchin, semper quies. So she even rhymes in answering, uh, have always um, uh, a rest, uh, um, uh, be, um, have a, a good day. Seid willkommen, Meister Hans. Seid willkommen. So uh, she uses the uh, courtly form of the Irzen. She doesn't use uh, the do, which you would expect among servants. And she addressed him as Meister Hans. Um, so uh, the master, which is reserved for learned paper. Schuster. Gott dank euch. Wahr ist der Herr? Köchin. Er ist im Sommerhaus. Ich will ihm rufen. Herr, Herr, der Schuhmacher ist da. Chor Herr. Oh, bene veneritis, Meister Hans. Schuster. Dio gratias. Chor Herr. Was bringt ihr mir die Pantoffeln? Schuster. Ja, ich gedacht, ihr wärt schon in die Kirche gegangen. Chorherr. Nein, ich bin hinten im Sommerhaus gewesen und hab abgedroschen. Schuster. Wie hohnt ihr gedroschen? So, to dreschen, do you know what that is? It's threshing out. Um, so, like the Karlstanz, yeah. So, and, uh, so the cobbler is, um, uh, completely surprised why should, uh, the, Canon be thrashing, and he says, "Yeah, um, ich bin hinten im Sommerhaus gewesen. Hab, um, ihr habt die gedroschen. Ja, ich habe meine Horas gebet. So I've been saying my hours. So the 
Um, as a canon, he is obliged to say his prayers five times um, a day, or even seven times for, uh, the monastic hours. Uh, uh, but he calls it um, dreschen, uh, so a completely mechanical way of getting through his uh, duties. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, ich habe meine Horas Gebet. I've given you uh, actually the, the text on the back of uh, the sheet, you might have found it. Um, <coughs> Und Horn alle mit meiner Nachtigall zu essen geben. So, uh, he has been <laughs> uh, feeding his pet bird while uh, just uh, reading mechanically through his um, obligations. Schuster. Hell, was haunt ihr für ein Nachtigall? Singt sie noch? So, uh, is the nightingale still singing? Um, so, that it was published in, uh, actually, in, in winter. Uh, Chorherr, oh nein, es ist zu spät im Jahr. Uh, so, the nightingale isn't any longer singing because uh, the time of year is advanced. Schuster, ich weiß, ein Schuhmacher, der hat ein Nachtigall, die hat erst angefangen zu singen. So, um, this is obviously referring to his own poem, Die Wittenbergische Nachtigall, which, uh, so, his pet nightingale is Luther, and Luther has just started singing. Um, uh, the Chorherr immediately recognizes uh, this allegorical meaning of the nightingale and says, Ei, der Teufel holt den Schuster mitsamt seiner Nachtigall. Wie hat er den allerheiligsten Vater, den Papst, die heiligen Väter und uns würdigen Herren ausgeholhibt wie ein Holhipp-Burb? So he has made a, um, like a, um, a caricature out of uh, us. Mm. The Schuster answers, I hell. Äh, fahrt schön, er hat doch nur euren Gottesdienst, Lehr, Gebot und Einkommen dem gemeinen Mann angezeigt. Und nur schlecht oben überhin, ist dann solches euer Wesen Hollhüppelwerk? Chorherr, was geht es aber solch unser Wesen den tollen Schuster an? Schuster, es steht Exodi am äh, 23. So du deines Feindes Esel unter dem Last siehst liegen, nicht lass ihn, sondern hilf ihm. Soll dann ein getaufter Christ seinem Bruder nicht helfen, soll er in sich äh, liegen in der Beschwert seiner Gewissen? And then, um, so the cobbler starts quoting the Bible. Um, and um, the canon can't compete with that. He then uh, sends off his uh, cook to get the Bible and she can't find it because uh, it's uh, lying in a dusty corner under uh, the bench. Unter der Bank liegen uh, was also a saying for us uh, to um, completely ignore uh, something. So um, Hans Sachs um, sets up um, a kind of unequal battle between um, these uh, two figures, which then proved so successful that, as I said, uh, it was translated in several languages and also was uh, picked up by um, uh, other uh, printing presses. Um, and it, um, uh, it might be fun just to end with the same passage in English uh, where you can see how the English translator has tried to keep um, the comic uh, character by uh, um, having the same rhetorical structure, uh, although um, reducing um, the amount of Latin that the characters speak. So um, he obviously thought it might perhaps put people off uh, having too much Latin at the start and also not uh, to be believable to an English audience who didn't have the Nuremberg background where a cobbler could go to a Latin school to have the cobbler speak. So the shoemaker coming to the parson's house speaketh to the person's servant. 
Good morrow, good fellow servant. You are welcome, Meister John. So it's also taking out uh, the comic constellation of a woman uh, servant uh, who speaks Latin and is more learned than the canon who, who is the only person in the house knowing where the Bible is actually uh, lying around. Servant, uh, ye are welcome, Master John. But it, it keeps uh, the polite form of address, the ye and you instead of thee and thou, which would be the familiar form of address. I thank you with all my heart. Where is your master? He's in the gallery. Oh, tarry a little. I will go and call him. Master, master, your Schumacher is here. Um, so, uh, so he didn't uh, use the Sommerhaus um, and the garden house instead of a gallery, probably because of the British weather not being plausible, uh, that a cannon in winter time would go into the castle. Bene veneritis ma uh, magister Hans, Deo gratias, what bring, what bring uh, you there? Do you bring uh, my slippers? So the pantoffel have become um, the slippers. All right, um, I'll stop uh, here. Um, I've uploaded...